Good evening. No? Okay. Welcome to Good Shepherd Free Lutheran Church. Um, we are excited to be able to have this opportunity tonight to host the um, Proclaim Choir and the Mixed Quartet as well. And so uh, when Mr. Hansen called me to let me know that this was something that they were wondering if we were interested in, uh, we jumped at the chance. And so thank you, Mr. Hansen, for giving us that opportunity. Uh, I want to thank the members of Good Shepherd Free Lutheran Church as well uh, for stepping up and hosting um, the, the, the students and, their, and uh, Mr. Hansen and his family and, and the rest. Um, you know, that's a great help. It's, as Mr. Hansen said, it's a, a wonderful part of the tour for the students them, themselves as well. Um, I also want to thank the choir, too, for coming to share your talents with us. Uh, and especially the message of what Christ has done in your life and what he does for all of us as well. Um, I want to announce as well um, that there will be a free, off free will offering taking at uh, just right after Pastor Osier's message. Um, and if you are writing a check, please write that out to Good Shepherd Free Lutheran Church. It just simplifies the process a little bit uh, for, for everyone. At this time then, hopefully you got one of these, uh, we will ask you to stand and we'll invite you to sing our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
everybody. My name is Lydia Carr, and I am a freshman at the Free Lutheran Bible College, and I'm from Tioga, North Dakota. So I'm going to be sharing my testimony with you guys tonight. So to start off with, I've been a Christian as long as I can remember. I'm a pastor's daughter. I'm the oldest of five. So being in the church was literally in my blood, and it's something that I enjoy doing and being a part of all of my life. Coming to Bible school was the obvious choice for me throughout my entire life. It was something I always knew I was going to do. My senior year of high school was very hard, and coming to Bible school felt like a breath of fresh air. It was something that was just so unique and different than anything I had ever been a part of before, and I assumed life was going to be perfect at the Free Lutheran Bible College. But it wasn't. Even though it is one of the best places I can imagine spending my first two years of college, it does have its flaws, and I thought it would make me perfect, and that was the flaw. When the trouble started coming, I didn't know how to react, and I was like, oh no, this is my high school experience all over again. How am I going to handle this? And that was right around the time that we had the Festival of Praise, and this was my first introduction to the Hallel and they are a group of psalms, and that was what we were singing on. And I remember one night during practice for the Festival of Praise, we were singing, and the lyrics spoke right to me. And it comes from Psalms 115, 9 through 11. It says, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Singing trust in the Lord over and over again. It felt like an audible voice coming from God. It could not be much clearer. And even though life did not get better immediately, and I wasn't able to just put my entire trust in God, I got there. And I cannot tell you that I completely trust God in all areas of my life and all times because we're sinful and I'm not perfect. But I can tell you that through my daily devotions and praying, I just feel this peace in what God has for me and my life. And that was something I did not experience before coming to the Free Lutheran Bible College. Another verse I'd like to share with you guys, one of my favorite verses is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understandings, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. God did not promise that we'd have an easy life. We are never guaranteed that. But when we trust in God and we do God's will for our life, it does show that we really will just understand what God has for our life. And it might not be easy, but with God, it'll work.
child of the promise. Come and made holy, our God, come to earth. Glory residing here in a poor manger. Come to redeem us and show us our worth. Glory to God in the highest. Peace and goodwill to all men. Glory to God in the highest. Forever and ever. On this silent night In love he has come here To bear all our sorrows To end all our darkness And make all things right Glory to God in the highest Peace and goodwill to all men Glory to God in the highest, forever and ever, amen, forever and ever, amen. Fall on your knees, O oh, He. My name's Hunter Bernston, and I'm, a, I'm also a junior at the Bible College. And uh, I just want to start with asking you guys a question. Um, oh, you, you guys all celebrate Christmas, right? Yeah. Well, duh. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, how long, I want to know, like, how long y'all leave your Christmas decorations up? Because around our house, Mom usually takes them down, like, like you know, first week of January. How many of you guys have them up and, like, take them down the day after New Year's Eve? Like, the, like New Year's Day or something. No? Okay. No one? Okay. Uh, how about, how many of you guys ha still have them up like middle of January? Okay, we've got, we got, got a few Christmas nuts over here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Yeah, well, I, I love Christmas, and you know, um, but I think it's almost a Christian cliche these days to say that uh, oftentimes in all the hustle and bustle of Christmas, we forget about Christ. We forget the reason for the season, so to speak. But I think the same thing often happens with uh, our good works. You know, we're so busy doing good things for God that we forget the reason we do them. We forget the reason that we're saved in the first place. I know that happened to me. You see, from a young age, I was confused about the relationship between faith and works. You know, I knew that uh, I was justified, I was saved by faith alone. I just wasn't sure how that uh, fit together with works. And it got to the point where when it, um, by my junior year, I'd been convinced myself that, well, God saved me by faith, but I maintained my salvation by my good works. And that led to a lot of doubt. Um, but, that, but that year, God did something to change that. My, my uh, church did a series on the book of Galatians. And, the book, and basically, the book of Galatians was written to, peop to people who had the same kind of problems I did. They were trying to add to what Christ did, sort of maintain their salvation or add to it their own work. And Paul had some very strong language for these people. Um, in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he writes, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn from just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Are you beginning with the Spirit and now trying to attain your goal by human effort? That's what I was doing. I was trying to attain my own salvation or keep my own salvation by my own work. That's not my job. It is God. God is the author of our salvation from beginning to end. This was the freedom in Christ that I discovered. So instead of looking to myself and my own work to prove that I was saved, I started looking to Jesus and his finished work on the cross. Your salvation does not depend on anything you have done, anything you've said. It depends on Jesus. It depends on the cross. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Salvation is not about us. It's about Christ. It's about the cross. It's not just about the manger where the baby lay. It's not all about the angels who sang for him that day. It's not all about the shepherds or the bright and shining star. It's not all about the wise men who traveled from afar. It's about the cross. Oh, it's about my sin. sin. It's about how Jesus, Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the sun that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. It's not just about the good things in this life I've done. It's not all about the treasures or the trophies that I won. It's not about the righteousness that I find within. It's all about His precious blood that saved me from my sin. It's about the cross. cross. It's about my sin. sin. It's about how Jesus, Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the soul that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. The cross, the beginning of the story is wonderful and great, but 
And it's the ending that can save you, and that's why we celebrate. It's about the cross, it's about my sin. It's about how Jesus, Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about God's Son. drop of blood that flowed from him when it should have been me. It's about the soul that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. So that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. Good evening. 
My name is Adam Osier, and I am uh, the new dean at the Free Lutheran Bible College. I just started my job last summer. I still have no idea what I'm doing. Um, But they told me to come here and talk, so I will. Um, No, we are a two-year Bible school, for those of you who don't know. It's a two-year Bible college in which we uh, really dig into God's Word. We spend two years digging into the Word deeply, kind of in a unique way. A lot of colleges, there are a lot of Christian colleges that have uh, Bible programs as part of their education. Uh, What we do is is unique in that we really uh, take uh, book by book, in many cases, uh, dig into God's Word in in not only an academic way, but a way that applies uh, to life, a way that applies to to the soul, to our heart, as we trust in Christ. Uh, Another interesting piece about us is that we are residential. We have a community uh, as we come together. That community discipleship is a big part of our program, and and we are blessed by God. I was was in that program myself, I don't want to admit how many years ago, because it's strange to think that it was like 15 years ago uh, that I was in in, uh, the Bible college myself. I was actually here at one point singing in a choir like we are today, and it's, it's been a blessing. I've known many of your um, congregants, those who have come here to Good Shepherd. Uh, growing up, uh, the, the uh, Olsons, uh, I want to say the Pakchas, but they're not. Kirsten is, is now Pakcha, but Kirsten Olson, uh, David Olson, uh, and, and different individuals throughout the years, too, have been close with us. Uh, we're glad to be with you here today. I was asked to share, and the idea uh, that we are, are going for, as you see the front of your program cover today, is my soul longs to praise the Lord. That idea of longing. I want to read three verses from the end of the prophet Habakkuk. How many of you actually have ever read Habakkuk? How many of you who have read it could tell me what it's about right now? <laughs> me either, me either. No, I'm just kidding. We, we're studying it actually in our, our Bible study at church The last three verses are what I would like to read for you today. It says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me to tread on my high places. Father in heaven, these are your words. I pray that uh, from them you would speak to us today through your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would do this uh, for your glory and for for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1977, NASA launched into space two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Anybody remember that event? When they launched Voyager 1 and Voyager... I didn't. I wasn't there. I wasn't alive, actually. But the the purpose of that was to launch these spacecraft into space that would, among other things, as far as their uh, exploratory uh, missions that they were going on, right, that these spacecraft were going on, they would play in perpetuity the sounds of music and of the human heartbeat for all of space to hear. The part that that captured my interest in this particular uh, story that I read this week was that the playlist that was being played for all of space to hear. One of the pieces included was a piece from Beethoven's Opus 130. It was called the Cavatina Movement. And when asked why she chose this particular piece, Annie Druyan who was the mission's creative director, said this, and I want you to hear this quote. As soon as my colleague said, this message is going to last a thousand million years, I thought of this great, beautiful, sad piece of music on which Beethoven had written in the margin the word sensucht, which is German for longing. Part of what we wanted to capture, now here's what I want you to hear, part of what we wanted to capture in the Voyager message was this great longing we feel. It's this great longing that we feel. I think the theme of longing is something that we can each relate to, can't we? Don't we each have intense desires for something that we don't have? And and that which is lacking, don't we wish that to be supplied in full? I I think we're there. 
Don't we have a longing in our hearts? And, and I don't think that this is ingratitude. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's, I don't have everything I want, and therefore I'm going to feel sorry for myself. But, but I think that, that longing is, is normal, natural, and in some ways good. Because we long for good things. We long for good things. And that's part of who we are. We long for our fears, for instance, to give way to assurance. We want that which terrifies to be upended and replaced with peace. We long for injustices to be righted. Does anybody watch the news? Right? Doesn't it seem... I mean, you you don't even have to turn on the news for a long time. I mean, you could just glance through your phone, which some of you probably want to do right now anyway, and and look at Fox News, CNN, pick whichever, pick whatever you want. And we see wrong being called right, and right being called wrong, don't we? We see injustice. We see people who are being treated unfairly, court systems perverting the truth. We see the helpless left undefended. We want that to stop, and it's right for us to want that to stop. We long to trade our sorrows for joy. We long to trade our hunger for spiritual, both both spiritual and physical hunger, for true and lasting satisfaction. We want to see sin and all its effects wiped away from our lives and to be made whole. And that is right longing. That is correct longing. It's asking God when, God why, God how, God how are you going to make this right? Because God is the one to whom we should turn for those answers. This is exactly the message that Habakkuk lays out for us, this seldom-read prophet, whose closing words that I just read to you today. I want you to notice two things from this this, uh, passage. And the first is this. Our longings are not going to be satisfied by earthly circumstances. Our longings are not going to be satisfied by earthly circumstances. Habakkuk is this remarkable book It's more relevant, if you read the whole book, uh, three chapters, it's short, you can read it tonight. But as you read it, it's actually more relevant to us today than tomorrow's newspaper is. That, That is how relevant Habakkuk is, because his longings are the same as our longings. As we read this book, we're invited into a dialogue that he has with God. And he goes before God, he said, God, listen, all these things are going wrong. Justice is perverted, nobody's doing right. All the things that we know to be true and good and perfect are not happening. When are you going to come and fix this problem? And he sits back and he listens for God to answer. And God does. And God gives him this answer that was very uncomfortable. He he says, I'm going to do something before your eyes that you wouldn't believe even if I told you. I'm going to send the Babylonians to come and make things worse. And and Habakkuk's like, no, God, I said, when are you going to make it better? Right? When are things going to get better? Not, Not worse. They're worse than we are. And God basically tells him, I'm going to judge them too. But, but God allowed them to go, and, and the people of Judah, he allowed them to go through these difficulties, these difficult earthly circumstances, these unpleasant circumstances, so that God could draw people through them to himself. Ultimately, through it all, God would demonstrate that we're not promised that our longings for prosperous life and the eradication of our sadness or injustice or suffering and all the evils in this world would be satisfied in this life the way that we'd like it. We live in a broken world and suffering is a reality of that world. And then we get into verse 17 of chapter 3. He says, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. He's describing in this passage complete and utter economic disaster. He describes a situation in which all that could be counted on in this life would be stripped away, and he's left with no earthly thing on which he can count. This is Habakkuk now praying. All of this... All of this, though though all of this be true, I acknowledge that as a reality. Yet he closes his prophecy in a way that he doesn't throw in the towel. He doesn't succumb to despair. We know this from the very next word, which begins verse 18 in our text. This little word, yet. Yet. Yes, things may even get uglier than they are now, yet. Yet. I may be left with no earthly possession or dime to my name yet. And with that yet, he flips the script and he shows us our second thing that I would like us to notice from this text and that our longings are fulfilled and satisfied by God alone. 
C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, anybody read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity? He says in that book that if there are longings in our heart that are not satisfied or met in this life, the only logical conclusion is that we are meant for another world. Another way to say this is that this life isn't all there is. But there's a place where all of these longings are satisfied. Habakkuk tells us that this place where all of our longings are satisfied is with the Almighty. In the face of disaster, in the face of sorrow and grief and pain, Habakkuk rejoices in two things. I want to highlight them quickly. And the first is that God is his salvation. God is his salvation. In verse 18 he says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy. Notice the rejoice and joy language in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk understands something here that we need to understand today. Our joy and our rejoicing comes not from what we have here, as wonderful as even the best moments of this life have for us. Hunter was talking about Christmas. I love Christmas. There's a lot of joy there. There's something even more joyous than that. It's the message of Christmas, right? It's the message of the cross. Our joy comes not from earthly circumstances, but from the promise that God has rescued us and provided us with life that cannot end. As Christians, we have a vantage point that Habakkuk didn't. Habakkuk looked forward to the promised salvation of God, yet he he didn't exactly know. He searched, he longed to know, as we read in the New Testament, those prophets did long to know what exactly God was going to do, yet we get to look back on it. We know exactly what that was, and it was the cross of Jesus Christ. On his cross, Jesus ensured that everything for which we long has been won. The fears, the injustices, the sorrows, the hunger, and the sin that broke this world were paid for in full. And his resurrection ensures that not even death itself can hold us down. Not even death itself. As a choir, uh, as a quartet, I should say, just saying, Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. The blood of Jesus paid for sin, paid for your sin, completely. There's nothing left. There's no debt left there on your account. He invites you to, to, in your longing, to trust that promise, to trust that assurance. You have a place to go now. That for which you long has been won, though our eyes don't yet see it. The second thing that, that he rejoices in, and briefly is that God then is his strength. We look to salvation, which we see ultimately culminating in heaven, right? None of us are there, and, and frankly, I'm kind of glad that, that we are all together tonight, and death is a sad thing in this life, so I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're together. And, and since we are, we have to walk through this life with the longings that we don't yet fully see realized. We have to walk with them, carrying those longings, thinking of of something that's yet to come in the future. But while we do, we see in this text that God is our strength. I met a woman, and and actually this is the reason I love this text so much. I went to visit this woman. as a I was an intern as a a pastor, and I went to visit her in her home. She was dying of heart failure, uh, and she knew that she would only have a few months to live. And I said to her, Millie, Is there any verses you would like me to read? And she said, Habakkuk 3, Pastor. (laughs) I said, where is that again? Is that in the... No. Uh, And and she she said this, and she, she quoted the verses to me, and in her version... It talks about how, how, you know, he will make, our version says he will make his, our feet like the deer's feet, and he will help us to tread on our, make us to tread on our high places. Her version was, uh, I think it was the NIV or maybe it's the RSV, something like that, but he said, he will make my feet like the hind's feet and he will get me over my mountain. And Millie saw those verses as God being her strength to get her through to the end when she would see him face to face. Is that what this text is talking about? Yes. But I want you to think about what deer do. How many have, have, have seen deer in their natural habitat out west, not in the flat country of Minnesota, but actually in mountains. Have you seen deer? Those things are amazing. 
right? The, the fact that they can walk on these tiny, tiny ledges with these feet, yet they are sure-footed. And they can bound up the mountain, get away from, get away from mountain lion, get away from all kinds of, of predators by navigating these things that you and I would die in 30 seconds on. But God says in this passage through Habakkuk that in this life, our feet, these rocky, these rocky paths, these craggy, ledgy, difficult things that we're going to walk through in this life are going to be walked with feet that are not our own. The strength that he gives us to march through the challenges of this life. That is the God we serve. And that's what God promises us here. He knows that we're going to face rocky and precarious struggles. But he assures us that we aren't going to do so apart from his sure-footed strength to guide us. When the Voyager spacecrafts were, were launched into space, the hope was that something somewhere, maybe, might hear this message of longing from humanity. That they would sense this longing of humanity as well. That they would feel it. But what we can't forget is that someone has heard our longing. God has heard our longing, and he's answered that longing by sending us his son, Jesus. As we trust in that promise of salvation, that promise that is for you, that he won for us, our longings for salvation are replaced with longings to praise him for it. Our heart longs to praise our Savior. I hope this is the longing of your heart today. Amen. Our final set is music that has become very near to us over the last two years. I'll let you read of the various facets in the program. Uh, but one thing I want to draw your attention to as we approach the season of Lent is that it is likely the same text that Jesus and his disciples sang in Scripture when it says they sang a hymn and then what departed the Mount of Olives um, right before his crucifixion. So as we consider the message that's been given to us about longing, but also praising the Lord. Um, I encourage you to, to consider that aspect, of, that the Christ sang these words as well. There will be opportunity for you to sing a couple of the choruses um, with us as we proceed, and, and that's in the music as well. I'll turn around and invite you to sing with us at those times.
Praise the Lord, O servants of the Lord. Sing your praise, lift your voices, and praise the living God. The Lord, the God of creation, the giver of life and breath, the redeemer of our souls, is worthy of our praise. Praise be to the Lord our God. This is the same God who made a covenant with Abraham and his people, a covenant that he would be their God and they would be his people. In that covenant, God established a relationship with a people whose history can be traced through Abraham and his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and the children of Israel. Israel's history also includes living in Egyptian bondage for over 400 years, experiencing oppression and servitude to rulers and people who did not see them as a special people chosen by God, but as a people to serve their own selfish purposes and needs. In God's perfect timing, a leader, Moses, was sent to lead his chosen people from their bondage to a promised land, a spacious land filled with milk and honey. In a 40-year journey filled with joy and sorrow, victories and losses, miracles and tragedies, God did lead his chosen people to Canaan, the place promised to Abraham, the promised land. <laughs>
is filled with encounters by nations who scoffed at their devotion to God. Many of these people had created gods that had become their idols of worship. Israel's history also reveals those who were faithful and devout in their service to the God of Abraham's covenant. There were others, though, who recklessly abandoned their faith, the covenant, and the commandments given to Moses on the Exodus journey. And yet God remained faithful in his commitment to Israel as he called forth leaders who repeatedly challenged his chosen people to live a life devoted to the creator of the world, the God of life and love. The clarion call to trust in the Lord, to depend upon him as sovereign king, ruler, and redeemer, resounded in the hearts of the spiritual leaders as they attempted to guide the Hebrew children into paths of righteous living, and as they encouraged them to live lives of grateful praise. Not to us, O Lord, be the glory, for your name we praise. Not to us, O Lord, be the glory, grateful songs of joy we raise.
The story of ancient Israel is a love story. It is a story of a people chosen by God to be the vehicle by which his love would be made known to the world. It is a story of relationships, of God desiring a living and loving relationship with the very people created in his own image. It is the story of a God who hears our cries in times of need, the God who hears our cries for mercy. It is a story of a God who hears our cries in times of anguish, the God who hears our cries in times of trouble and sorrow. It is the story of a God who hears our heart's deepest longing, the God who comes to redeem us. How can I repay the Lord for his goodness to me? I will fulfill my vows, my promises to the Lord in the presence of his people. I love the Lord, for he has heard my cry and granted my request. Long as I live and troubles rise, I'll hasten to the throne of the living God.
Like the chosen people of Israel, the people of God's covenant with Abraham, we were made to worship our Creator, the God of heaven and earth. Like the Hebrew children led out of Egyptian bondage, following a leader chosen by God, we have been provided a light to guide us into an eternal relationship with the God of the universe. With hearts of gratitude, we lift our voices, inviting all people of every nation to join us in exaltations, in praise, as we celebrate God's great love and faithfulness. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise the Lord, all you people of the earth. For God's steadfast love is great towards us, and his faithfulness endures forever. is a heart filled with gratitude. Gratitude for a Redeemer who has invited us into a personal relationship. Gratitude to the living God who provides for our deepest needs and delivers us from the bondages of our own making. Gratitude to the living God whose love endures forevermore. Gratitude to the living God who is our strength and song, the one who has become our salvation. Israel's story is filled with the hope that, and promise that God would one day send a Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. 
The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Open for me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to God, for he is good. His love endures forevermore.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to all, all of you who've had a part in this, from the accompanist to the director to uh, violinist and everybody. Thank you. Um, I want to, oh, and thank you to you for coming, too, as well. Um, I want to invite you now, as well, to join us for cupcakes afterwards. Um, this is a surprise to my wife. Yep, she gave me the look. She turned 40 on Monday. This wasn't, my, this wasn't even my idea. I can't fully take credit for this, but she turned 40, and so the cupcakes are in honor of her. So since we have a choir here... We're going to sing happy birthday to you. glad you all knew her name. <laughs> um, and this is for the hosts, those um, ha having students and, and others. Um, have them back here around 9.30 or 9.45. Uh, they don't have a really pressing schedule. Um, they'll be making their lunches here before they go. So thank you for coming. <laughs>